Well, Stuart, thank you very much uh, for that very warm introduction. I can see uh, my mother has been at your speaking notes. Um, ladies and gentlemen, every generation believes that they uh, live in the most complex, challenging uh, and difficult strategic circumstances in history. Uh, in fact, uh, there, there has become almost an intergenerational debate each time each generation develops uh, this understanding or this belief uh, that they live in uh, the most difficult uh, strategic times in history. I think such debates are largely uh, unjustified and unhelpful. I think what really needs to happen uh, on the part of strategic planners is for them to ask not whether they live in the most difficult and dangerous times, but what is different, what is new, uh, what is challenging about their current circumstances? What is it that should engage the interest of uh, and the planning skills of, de of defence planners in any particular period? I happen to believe uh, that there are a couple of different trends uh, that make the current era, the first quarter of the 21st century, uh, different uh, and challenging in a different way uh, to eras that have gone before. Uh, these are the, the two changes, uh, the rapid uh, empowerment and, uh, and, and wealth creation in the world's largest societies that exist in the Asian region, and the second one is the rise of information and communications technology. What I'm going to do today is, is focus very much on the, on the first. Uh, if we look at uh, current growth rates, uh, we can see uh, that economic growth is occurring at historically unprecedented rates and extent in the world's two continental economies. Now, what I mean by a continental economy is that the population of China and the population of India uh, each are larger than any of the world's continents other than the one that they occupy. So there is extremely rapid economic growth occurring in both of those economies and even more significantly, they are occurring, it is occurring at almost simultaneous uh, time. So a vast proportion of humanity is growing very quickly. And this can't help but have strategic consequences. I think one of the things that we lapse into uh, is probably a little bit of wishful thinking about the rise of these Asian giants. Because we hope, and I think uh, the Asian Century white paper that was released by the Australian government last year lapsed into this, this we hope that economic growth and rapid empowerment will take place without changing the demands that are being made by these countries. But I would argue, uh, and I argue in my paper, that economic growth is not secular, meaning that economic growth changes a society's conception of itself, it changes a society's conception of what is important and what is unacceptable in the world, and it changes a society's belief in the morality of its own actions. I firmly believe that we're starting to see the beginnings of change in both China and India and some of the other large countries in the Asian region as they rapidly grow and become powerful. The other major change uh, that has occurred um, that is strategically significant uh, for these major economies is uh, uh, the rise in their middle class. This is uh, directly lifted, this chart directly lifted from the Asian Century White Paper and it shows uh, that projecting out this century, the largest growth in the middle class, in fact the largest middle class, uh, will be in the Asian region. Uh, and the fact is that that has as big a role in changing society's views of themselves uh, as anything. Middle classes have new expectations of what they and their society should be able to achieve in the world. The next change I, I'd wa I want to talk to you about is the rapid increase 
in the external dependence of these major economies. Just to give you uh, a little bit of a flavour uh, uh, of what has been going on, between 1990 and 2007, China, China's oil consumption tripled. India's rose by two and a half times. According to the projections of the International Energy Agency, as the chart shows, uh, out to 2030, China's energy consumption will double again on today's, and India's will rise uh, by two and a half times. This is a huge rise uh, in uh, energy imports, and it means that uh, China has not been energy uh, self-sufficient since 1993. Uh, India has never been energy self-sufficient, and their self-sufficiency for energy will be falling over time. The fact is that given this demand uh, in uh, energy consumption, there is really only one uh, energy basin in the world that has any prospect of, uh, of supplying uh, this rapid increase uh, in demand. And that, of course, is the Gulf region. Now, the important thing to realise here is that these very large economies uh, in Asia uh, rely very much on the Gulf economies for their supply security. The disruption of energy flows, given the nature of energy, given the fact that energy can't be stockpiled and needs to be used very quickly, could have enormous uh, social, economic and political effects were it to be cut off. But if you flip that around, uh, the big uh, Asian economies, China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, uh, India, represent the most dependable source of demand security for the Gulf economies. Many of the Gulf economies uh, rely very much on their, uh, the, the, the revenues that they make from oil exports. And so this draws them together in a real sense of strategic uh, interdependence. The other form of external dependence on the outside world that is important is what has been called by economists global production sharing. This is a chart of the auto industry based in Thailand. Global production sharing is a new form of interdependence. It means that uh, successive stages of the manufacturing cycle of any particular product, any manufactured product, are sliced up and located geographically wherever it makes sense in terms of price to put them. Asia uh, is, the most, uh, is the region that has most advanced global production sharing in the world. And uh, to throw another figure at you, global production sharing will comprise between 70 and 80 per cent of the manufacturing growth of the Asian region for the next 25 years. Just to give you an example of what happens and the form of interdependence that occurs, the March 2011 uh, Fukushima disaster in Japan, it cut auto production in Japan of, of automobiles and auto parts by 47%. Uh, that had a knock-on effect of cutting the Thai auto production by 19.7% and by 24% in the Philippines. The Fukushima disaster cut uh, electrical uh, production or electrical uh, goods production in Japan by 8.25%. Uh, that flowed on to a 17.5% drop in the Philippines and an 8.4% drop in Malaysia. So you can see just how uh, dependent not only the energy and mineral sectors but also the, the, the manufacturing sectors of uh, Asian countries uh, are starting to uh, become much more dependent on the outside world. The other thing that has occurred, and, and this would be my third big strategic change, is that you have, uh, with the rapid rise and rapid empowerment of many of these uh, larger Asian countries, you have the end of uh, what was a fairly flat power topography uh, in the Asian region. What I mean by that is between the end, uh, end of the Vietnam War and the end of the 20th century, you had a situation in Asia in which there was no country that was large enough, wealthy enough and internally unified enough to be able to contemplate a bid for regional uh, leadership and regional dominance. 
the rapid empowerment obviously of China, but also potentially of a few other countries has changed that situation. I'm not for a moment implying that China has any great plans for regional domination, but the point is that other countries can imagine China uh, being able to mount such a bid. And this has given rise uh, to a much deeper uh, process of strategic rivalry that is occurring uh, around uh, the, the Asian region and includes the United States. So ladies and gentlemen, if you put all of those uh, factors together, I think that for the foreseeable future, the strategic situation and strategic dynamics of the Asian region will be characterised by what I call rivalrous interdependence. Deep economic interdependence between uh, the component states of the region, but beset by deepening rivalry. As the interdependence gives rise to greater wealth, uh, the greater wealth give ri gives rise to greater rivalry. On the one hand, you can't have the rivalry resolve itself in uh, an all-out power contest because the interdependence uh, constrains it. Neither can the interdependence develop into a Europe-style uh, process of political and strategic inter integration because the, uh, the rivalry prevents it. So you have this situation uh, of, as the Indonesian foreign minister calls it, uh, dynamic e equilibrium, held in check by these two contradictory trends of rivalry and interdependence. I think in these conditions of rivalrous interdependence, you have an increasing situation of st strategic claustrophobia developing in some of Asia's largest states. By this I mean that they are worried about their external dependence. Countries like China have never before been so dependent on external supplies of energy and minerals or external markets for their economic well-being. Furthermore, countries like India and China have come out of long periods of autarkic economic policies. To be in a situation where their manufacturing success and their manufacturing factors depends on an extended chain of manufacturing in other countries is highly disconcert disconcerting. And when it's transposed into the strategic realm, there is a great worry in many of the capitals of the Asian region about one's rivals manipulating one's own dependencies. Planners in Beijing must be worried about the fact that so much of their energy comes through sea lanes uh, that are controlled or at least could be threatened by so many of their rivals. And so the worry about rivals manipulating one's own dependencies is countered increasingly by uh, positioning one's own capabilities to be able to potentially manipulate one's own rivals' dependencies. And this is a situation, I think, that will develop into the, into the near term and medium term. What we've seen as a consequence of these anxieties is, to some extent, a normalisation of Asian security. Uh, a, the period where uh, post-independence many Asian countries uh, concentrated a lot of their resources and a lot of their initiative on maintaining internal security has come to an end and we've seen the flipping of Asian defence expenditure to concentrate to a much greater extent on external uh, security concerns. A recent report by the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, or SIPRI, has uh, charted a 200% increase in arms acquisitions in Southeast Asia uh, over the period uh, from uh, 2007 to 2011. That's a 200% increase over the period 2002 to 2006. Most importantly, I think, is that the increase in arms acquisitions has been predominantly in naval weapons acquisitions. Ships and maritime weapons, according to the CIPRI report, have made up 
of all arms acquisitions in Southeast Asia, and another 37% could be, uh, have been uh, uh, directed towards weapon systems that could be used in maritime uh, operations. So we have a system, I think, of ri rising naval capabilities and rising naval rivalries. And when you put that uh, uh, against the, the map of Asia, I think it starts to draw out a very, very interesting picture. If you have these sorts of external dependencies stretching uh, from the Gulf region all the way around the Asian coastline, all the way up to Japan and Korea in North Asia, uh, and you combine that with a situation of this rivalrous interdependence and a wariness about direct confrontation and direct clashes, I think what the maritime geography of the Indo-Pacific region uh, provides are lots of options for horizontal escalation. And by horizontal escalation, I mean a situation in which uh, a country is confronted by uh, force or some sort of démarche along one part of that Indo-Pacific geography, it can offset by raising the stakes in another part of the, of the geography. So, for example, if the United States uh, was to uh, find itself locked into a confrontation with China somewhere in the South China Sea, it would have the option of perhaps threatening Chinese shipping coming through the Indian Ocean. Uh, likewise, if, uh, if uh, China was to find uh, itself in an in uncomfortable situation somewhere up near the Gulf, it could threaten US uh, shipping uh, closer to its own coastlines. So I think the options of horizontal escalation are very much there and are very much being thought about. What this leads me uh, to believe, ladies and gentlemen, in the paper is that we shouldn't so much concentrate on maritime choke points, which is what analysis tends to do when it looks at this particular map and this particular geography. Uh, because uh, choke points, I think, probably, or being able to dominate choke points gives very short-term benefits and, and, is, and is potentially quite um, undiscriminating in terms of the shipping it affects. I think what Asia's maritime geography uh, offers to rising powers is the lure of enduring political and strategic predominance over, over key strategic features. And in the conclusion of my remarks, I'd just like to speculate as to what some of those uh, strategic features might be. Conveniently, I think there are six, and they divide quite neatly into three peninsulas and three bays. Uh, and here I've called them the West Pacific Peninsula, uh, travelling west, the Indo-Pacific Peninsula and the South Asian Peninsula. If you read the work of some of the, uh, the maritime strategists, peninsulas and bays uh, have particular features. Peninsulas, I believe, tend to constrain, concentrate and bundle power. Strategic shifts in any one part of a peninsula can cause great instability in the entire peninsula and if they gain momentum, they can cascade down through the peninsulas. I think observing uh, some of the campaigns of the Second World War can show just how peninsular geography can work in a strategic sense. The interesting thing about these two peninsulas, let me take the outside ones first, the South Asian Peninsula and the West Pacific Peninsula. In many ways, these two peninsulas hold the keys to China's and India's sense of strategic claustrophobia. The South Asian Peninsula for India, the West Pacific Peninsula for China. Each of these peninsulas are partly occupied by strategic rivals or allies of key strategic rivals of China and India, respectively. Each of these peninsulas contain territories that are key to their historical sense of wholeness. I'm particularly talking about Taiwan in relation to China and, uh, and parts of uh, what is now Pakistan in, in terms of, of India. 
each of these powers, each of these rising powers, to an extent feels tied down by the current situation in these two particular uh, peninsulas. And there is a deep belief, I think, in both countries' military hierarchies that without fundamental change uh, in the strategic situation in these two peninsulas, uh, each country will be unable to fulfil its real strategic potential. In the middle is the Indo-Pacific Peninsula, stretching from northern Thailand down through the Malaysian Peninsula, through the Indonesian archipelago and into northern Australia. This is, if anything, as crucial as the other two. It is obviously the archipelagic and uh, peninsular uh, barrier between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. Any country that is able to develop dominance over this uh, particular peninsula can project power and project force both ways, both into the Pacific Ocean and into the Indian Ocean. Let me move on very quickly uh, to the bays. Three bays to match three peninsulas, the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal and the South China Sea. Uh, again, bays uh, are, are particularly uh, interesting. They are enclosed bodies of water. These three bays historically have got a very rich uh, trading history. If you go back to before the European arrival in the Indian Ocean, the Arabian Sea was controlled by Arab traders, the Bay of Bengal by Indian traders and the South China Sea by Chinese traders. Gives a very strong sense of historical entitlement uh, over these bays. They engage the historic uh, imagination and uh, each of these bays is uh, the, the, the home to particular territorial disputes that engage a major power and several smaller uh, powers in these particular parts. So I think our strategic geography, Asia's maritime geography, is going to be increasingly determined by competition over three uh, peninsulas and three bays, and they are interconnected. In a way, the bays are the key to the peninsulas, and the peninsulas are the keys to the bays. No country, no rising country that is dependent on uh, the, uh, the trade flows in this part of the world can allow uh, attempts at dominance at any of any of these particular bays or peninsulas to go uh, unchallenged. Very quickly, just to finish up, ladies and gentlemen, what are the implications, particularly for Australia? The first one is that we need to realise that geographically and strategically, Australia is very much a part of the Indo-Pacific Peninsula and it will be part of the strategic competition that emerges over time for this particular part of the world. I think you can already see the outlines of competition under conditions of rivalrous interdependence in our particular part of the world. The second implication is that the choices in each of these bays and peninsulas made by smaller states are going to be important. None of the great powers is going to be able to uh, have its own way or establish dominance without the free agreement of the smaller states of these peninsulas. And so another way of saying that is that for a smaller state like Australia, our choices are heavily interdependent and heavily depend on the choices made by other countries that are more our size. The third implication I would say for Australia is that two countries uh, that are part of two very crucial peninsulas emerge as very important. Japan in the West Pacific Peninsula, Indonesia in the uh, Indo-Pacific Peninsula are real strategic swing states. The way that they choose uh, to play out the strategic rivalry is absolutely crucial uh, for Australia and the region's future. So without further ado, I'll leave it there and uh, Look forward to what uh, Peter Jennings has to say. Thank you.